Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Japan and we're going to have a look at another collaboration beer. So out of the two breweries involved in this one, it's only the home brewery that's featured on the channel before. They have been on the channel many, many times. One of the first Japanese breweries I encountered, a very well respected and very well established name within the Japanese beer scene. And uh, yeah, I think it's fair to describe them as being very solid all around. I've had lots of different beers from them over the years, many different styles, and they've always been very, very good actually. Potentially my favorite Japanese craft brewery, in fact. When it comes to the Away Brewery, these guys are a brewery that are completely new to me. I had never heard of them before making the brewery notes for this video. They've been around a very long time though, very well respected within the Japanese beer scene from what I gather, and they have been pretty prolific over the years. So. Yeah, I'm glad I'm able to introduce them to you now, better late than never, but I do hope I can get some of their own beers to review on the channel at some point in the, the near future, because a lot of people, um, since I told them I had one of these beers, have told me, yeah, that's a brewery that I really need to check out. Now, when it comes to the beer itself, this is one of the home brewery's latest releases. It's a style that I very much enjoy. One that I don't think you see enough of these days. I wish more breweries would have a go at this. I haven't had too many Japanese brewed examples of this one either, actually. But uh, yeah, it is supposed to be a very good beer. So needless to say, I'm very, very curious to see what this beer is going to have in store for us. Hopefully it's another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review. And as always, I hope that you guys watching enjoy my take on this one as well. So yeah, for this review then, for the home side of things, we are going to head up toward the Tohoku region of Japan on the northern part of Honshu. To be specific, we are going to go to the prefecture of Nagano and we are going to the city of Yamanuchi. And that means that we're going to have a look at another beer from the wonderful Tamamura Honten who sell their beers under the name Shiga Kogan. So this beer is simply called Quadruple. It comes in at 13% ABV. I think you know what style it is from the name, but this one is brewed in collaboration with Zakoku Kobo, uh, who are from Ogawa in Saitama Prefecture, just a little bit to the northwest of Tokyo. So um, yeah, this is yet another beer that I got from the wonderful liquor shop Asahiya in Taishibashi and Maichi here in Osaka. My kind of go-to, or one of my go-tos when I come to Osaka. A little beer shop run by Koji and mainly his daughter Rika these days. They've always got a great selection of Japanese stuff and I would highly recommend that you check them out. I'll put the link to their Facebook page in the video description below. But um, yeah, definitely cool to review another Japanese quadruple. It's been a long time, I think, since I've had one of these, but uh, a style that I very much enjoy and two breweries that have very, very good reputations in the Japanese beer scene. So I have high hopes for this one, needless to say. But let's crack on with it and see what this beer is going to have in store for us. So as always with my reviews, I'll tell you a little bit about the breweries before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though, just fast forward. All the usual links can be found in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Tamamura Hunt and Shiga Kogan beer and my future reviews that hopefully I can do from, uh, I need to get the pronunciation of this right, Zakoku Kobo. Uh, very first time I'm trying a beer involving them as I've mentioned but hopefully we can review some of their own beers going forward we'll add those to that list like I said but there's all the usual social media down there if you want to see more reviews do please consider subscribing to the channel the support that you give is massively appreciated and remember you can go into the channel homepage and search for beer using the geography tagging system so just go in there use the little search bar put in your hometown state county province whatever you like if I reviewed beers from the area that you search for they will pop up. Failing that though, you can check out the playlist of beers from different countries. You'll find this beer in the Japanese playlist along with a number of other things. That's being edited very regularly of course because we do get quite a bit of Japanese beer in Hong Kong and I'm over here visiting my son very regularly. But yeah, um, do check out the playlist of beers from other countries as well because there are some very interesting things on the channel these days. But yeah, let's go on to my brewery notes then and I'll tell you a wee bit about the breweries. We'll start off with Tamamura Honten since they are the home brewery in this case. So as I mentioned to you earlier, Tamamura Honten are based in Yamanuchi and Nagano Prefecture in Japan, which you'll find a couple of hundred kilometers to the northwest of Tokyo. Very famous for its natural beauty 
and its ski slopes, of course. But uh, the Tamamura Honten Company began brewing sake back in 1805, and they recently began brewing beer under the name Shiga Kogen, which translates into English as like Shiga Heights or Shiga Mountain. So Shiga Heights beer, Shiga Mountain beer, whatever you want to say. But they also produce wine as well. But the head brewer is uh, Sato Ego, and he joined the company in 2003. But the idea to brew beer apparently came as the numbers of skiers visiting the resort began to dwindle. And so in May of 2004, they applied for their brewing license and they received it a couple of months later. They bought their brewing equipment and they trained for a week at a brewery down in Kyushu before beginning their own commercial beer activities with only a consultant for help. Needless to say, it went very well for them though. But Tamamura Honten as a company produced their own hops, their own sake rice, buckwheat, blueberries, uh, they've got their own variety of hop that they use in a number, number of their beers called Shinsu Wazi. This is a hybrid between Czech sats and a local variety. And they've also used it as a bittering hop as well. But in some of the IPAs, they've been using it as an aroma hop as well. So the um, Tamamura Hunt and Shiga Kogan IPAs are a little bit unique and that's probably why. But they also have uh, two tasting rooms which they call tepper rooms. There's one at the brewery and also one at uh, in Ichinose at the Hotel Shali Shiga and the bottle art is designed by Tanaka Noriyuki. Um, who has been with them for many years from what I understand. But as of October 2024, when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced 130 different kinds of beer according to Untapped. And like I said, they are a very, very well-respected name when it comes to uh, Japanese craft beer. Uh, yeah, these guys are one of the classic stories, you know, started off as a sake brewery, expanded into beer. There are quite a few uh, sake breweries that have done that, but there are some others, of course, that have come into it very, in uh, very, very different ways. Japan is, um, is very interesting when it comes to the craft beer brewery stories. But yeah, Shiga Kogan beer are one of the ones that I would highly, highly recommend that you check out. But yeah, that is everything I can really tell you about uh, Shiga Kogan beer and the Tamamura Honten company for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the REIT Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So yeah, let's go on to the other brewery then. And I'm going to try and make sure I pronounce this right. So yes, uh, Zakoku Kobu or Kobo, I think is the correct pronunciation. So Kobo Kobo Microbrewery is based in the small town of Ogawa in Saitama Prefecture, which you'll find just a little bit to the northwest of Tokyo, like I said. And the brewery was founded back in 2003 by Baba Isamu. And the name translates into English as Grain Workshop. So yeah, literally Grain Workshop Brewery. So Isamu Baba was born into a farming family in Fukaya in Saitama, but he went on to study electrical engineering and then actually taught at a university. But while he was at home, he'd often be working behind a computer, but in his spare time, he would take his children to a local store to buy seeds and plants and do other DIY activities with them. So he retired at 58 and then moved to Ogawa and it was then that he started growing vegetables and returned to his family roots of uh, growing wheat. But one day at the local store that he visited often, he came across a beer making kit and this gave him the idea of using his own wheat uh, to brew the beer. But as it turns out, he was also very lucky because he had moved to Ogawa, which is very famous for its water. But after he retired, he obtained a brewing license and established the brewery, including a small pub just underneath. And he apparently underestimated the level of work that was needed for the brewery. And so his daughter Yumiko and her husband Hitoshi Suzuki joined the company in about 2008. But they had good jobs in Tokyo, but they felt they were just at a stage in life where they were too busy with work. So they wanted to change things up and uh, have a sore life. But after agreeing to help out Baba a little, Hitoshi soon found that he was hooked on the idea of making beer. So that was um, his new profession, basically. That's how it turned out. But uh, they opened a new brewery facility in 2019. They've got the brewery downstairs and a pub upstairs, and the first beers from the new brewery were released in early 2020. But over the years, these guys have built up a very good reputation for themselves, but they remain a very small uh, volume brewery from what I understand. A lot of their beer is just sold in that local uh, Ogawa area, which is probably why I've never come across any of their stuff before. So maybe I'll need to make an internet order for when I'm back in Japan 
in uh, December. We'll need to see about making that happen. But yeah, um, as of October 2024, when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced around 250 different kinds of beer according to Untapped and uh, they've done a whole variety of uh, different styles. But like I say, uh, this is a brewery that I had never come across before, but they seem to be very, very well respected by their peers in Japan, which is um, always a good thing. It's the way the culture kind of works here. If you have the respect of your peers, that is uh, very meaningful, of course. But um, yeah, um, that's everything I can really tell you about um, I just not this one. This one is difficult to pronounce. Zakoku Bob, uh, Zakoku Kobo, uh, microbrewery, the Green Workshop Brewery from Ogawa and Saitama. If you want to learn more, check out the brewery website. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the Rate Beer Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So, um, yeah, to tell you a little bit about this beer itself. So, as I mentioned to you at the start of the video, this one comes in at 13% ABV. As the name tells you, it's a Belgian style called Rupel. This one apparently is brewed as a sort of joint celebration of Shiga Kogan and Zakoku Kobo's uh, 20th anniversaries. It uses a uh, spelt, which obviously is a very old type of wheat grown by Shiga Kogan, and it uses rye uh, grown by the guys at Sokoku. And apparently this is the highest ABV beer that Shiga Kogan have ever produced. And it was allowed to rest for six months uh, before it was released. I'm not sure if that was in the fermentation vessel or if they've kept the bottles for six months before um, they released it. The Japanese translation that I had wasn't um, overly clear, in all honesty. But um, yeah, um, that's all you need to know about the beer. I'll just let you have a little quick look at the artwork on this one before we open it up. But there you can see the Tamamura Honten Dragon there. And here you can see the Zakoku Kobo uh symbol as well there which is um yeah it's a cat kind of just chilling and enjoying um looks like he's chilling and enjoying the hot flowers and uh, he has wheat for a tail which is quite interesting and that's obviously um uh an ode to uh, baba's family um and their history of uh, of farming but yeah you can see this one the label on this is actually like a lot of the the kind of more old school shiga kogan beers like the house ipa for example, which is quite cool. But yeah, you can see it's got that classic Tamamura Honten Shiga Kogan beer cap on it. Um, like I said, 30% quadruple this one. Um, this should be very, very nice when we know, well, knowing Shiga Kogan beer. So let's get this guy out into the glass then and see how we go. I'm very curious to try this one. So nice little bit of smoke on the opening there and we'll get it out and into the glass. So, there we go. I have to say, this one's actually behaved itself quite well. I'm always a bit wary of Belgian style beers because they can get a little bit excited and sometimes explode on you. But yeah, um, you know, the guys at uh, Shiga Kogan, uh, they, they know the stuff, they know what they're doing. So yeah, they'll condition the beer properly. So yeah, um, anyway, before the head disappears on this one, we can safely say that it's poured, it poured with maybe about a two-third finger of a frothy, I would say kind of fawn-coloured head. I'll just bring that up and let you guys have a little look at this before that disappears. You can see some medium-sized bubbles on the surface of the liquid there, a few foamier ones the further up that you go. But um, yeah, it looks very nice, this one. If we shine the light through the beer, it's actually one of the more kind of ruby-leaning um, quadruples that I've seen over the last little while. I think I've had um, two or maybe two quadruples quite recently, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, one from England and uh, there was another one, I forget where that was from. But yeah, um, I seem to be getting quite a few quadruples at the moment, which I'm not complaining about because I do miss this as a style. But yeah, certainly one of the more kind of ready quadruples that I can remember having come across, perhaps uh, a good colour description of this one would be like a slightly stained mahogany or maybe chestnut is a good way to describe the colour of this one. But yeah, remember the colour of your beer depends on a few different things. One, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. 
two, length of your wort boil is going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugar is caramelised and thus you get a darker colour of beer. But any battle aging that you do or adjuncts you put into the beer will affect its colour as well. And when it comes to brown beers like this, the battle aging and the adjuncts can play a role. And when it comes to the quadruple specifically, and yeah, I guess Belgian Abbey beers would be the correct term. What they tend to do with these is they put a little bit of uh, sugar in them, usually candy sugar or brewing sugar or something like this. And that's how you get the lighter mouthfeel with the Belgian style beers, but the higher ABV. And that's why you also need to pay attention for them exploding sometimes. That's how it goes. But yeah, I'm guessing the colour of this one will be mainly down to the types of grain that they've used, the uh, the spelt and the uh, the rye in this one. But yeah, maybe the sugar will have played a little role too. One or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head there. The head has incidentally just faded away to be a kind of thinner foamy layer and you've got that nice kind of big ring around the edge of the glass there. A um, little bit of natural haze to it as well, which is to be expected, but all in all, nothing too surprising about this uh, the appearance of this beer when you consider what style it is. So um, yeah, let's go on and have a little look at the aroma of this one and see what it's all about. I'm very, very curious about this. Oh, that smells good. And it smells pretty damn authentic as well. Because most of the time when you try a, um, a quadruple and yeah, triples as well, in fairness, a lot of the time. But when you try some of these Abbey brewed beer, Abbey style beers brewed abroad, they just they have the same flavour profiles. They have the right flavour profile, but it just it's just never the same, um, in honesty. But this one, I have to say, this is one of the first foreign um, Belgian Abbey style beers, or foreign brewed, I should say. I've come across where I can say, yeah, this is actually very, very unique. So probably they've imported a lot of the uh, ingredients that are used in this one, maybe even the specific brew sugars and stuff. So um, yeah, that's pretty interesting, this one, but it gives you everything you'd expect of a quadruple. One of the things I would say about this one is that it has got a wee bit more of a kind of oily breadiness to it in the aroma, and it's also got a little bit of a brighter fruity character than some of the other ones that I've come across. It's not overly oily and brown sugary uh, either actually so that's quite an interesting point but again you can smell it's very clean i often talk about japanese craft beer being very very clean you can smell that in this one uh, japanese craft beer obviously has to have that element of drinkability because that's how wider japanese society views beer it's something to uh, be light and drinkable almost but the aroma of this is beautiful so let's break it down and just describe that for you a wee bit more in depth so, the backbone of this beer, of course, you've got that lovely kind of fresh rye bready bread crust in there. I loved my rye bread when I lived in Germany, so that really sticks out for me with this one. But the rye is quite oily and quite smooth at the same time. There's little elements of woodiness to the beer. Um, there's a little bit of cracker, of course. Nice big oily rye bread. It's almost got a little bit of like a kind of brandy or um, sherry soaked, like fruity brown bread, uh, sort of note to it, fruit loaf type thing is maybe a good way to say that. So there's a little bit of that kind of vibe coming out of this beer in my opinion. But um, yeah, on top of that, you do get a little bit of an almost slightly fruit cakey type note. But yeah, wholemeal brown bread for sure. Little elements of um, nuttiness in the beer. And then, yeah, it's all about the brown sugars above that. So you can smell a little bit of a toasty brown sugar in there. There's some lovely sort of oily um, sweet caramel, McVitie's Digestive Biscuit. Um, yeah, it doesn't have any real kind of leathery brown sugary characters to it. And usually when you get leathery brown sugars, that's a sign that the beer has undergone a longer warp boil. But that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't really seem to be the case with this one, just based on the aroma. But um, yeah, I'm, I don't know if there's much else we can say about the malty side of things. So let's have a little look at the, um, the yeasty part then. The yeasty character in the beer will come out on the back of your nose. So yeah, it's actually got a lovely kind of smooth and slightly sweet brown bready yeasty character to it. 
And there's a wee bit of cracker and stuff within that yeasty part too, but yeah, mostly a sweet kind of brown bread. On the hoppy side of things, and remember the quadruple is not the most hop forward style of beer, but you are still getting a good little bit of green component out of this one. Um, it's got a little bit of, I think it's probably English hops in this one, maybe a bit of Bramling's Cross. Um, just from the aroma. But yeah, you've got that little bit of earthiness in there. You've got that bit of distinct kind of herbal and woody kind of character. And yeah, there's little bits of floral aromaticity, some wet sort of freshly cut leafy grass. There's a good little bit of that uh, coming out in this one too. So um, yeah, the way that that goes together, I think, is uh, it's really, really nice. On the fruity side of things, it's actually very, very soft. Um, it's kind of strawberry and grapeish. And normally with these beers, of course, you'd want like, or you would get like plums and raisins and uh, figs and stuff like that. Maybe there's a little bit of fig in this one in fairness. So yeah, I would say figs, but there's a lot of like, um, yeah, there's a lot of sort of grapey and um, sort of candied strawberry type notes to the fruity side of the beer. Um, maybe a little touches of like sultana and stuff, maybe a little touch of date. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting this one. Yeah, when you sugar it up a little bit more, you start to get lovely kind of softer red fruity characters coming out of the beer. So all in all, a really interesting one for me. The aroma of this is, is on the fruity side of things is quite different from uh, yeah from what um, I've had in uh, in these in these quadruples before, but very very clean as I say, which is a kind of characteristic of the uh, of Japanese beer. So um, yeah, this one I think could turn out to be very interesting. So as I always say, take a little bit of time to just enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck into it. But I think it's about time that we try this one. So yeah, this one is the Quadruple, very simple name, the 20th anniversary beer of both uh, Shiga Kogan beer from Yamanuchi in Nagano Prefecture and Sokoku Kobo uh, from Ogawa in Saitama, closer to Tokyo, a 13% quadruple I think this will be a pretty damn good actually so happy anniversary or may the toe to both breweries long may you guys continue let's get stuck in slanja skull cheers kampai oh yeah That is damn good. So, I'm going to say straight away, if you come across a bottle of this, yeah, um, have a go at it. This is good. Um, it did say, um, there was quite a big description of this one on Untapped, which I went through the Japanese and translated. That's where I got the bit about the spelt and the, um, the rye and stuff like this. They did recommend actually in that that you get two bottles and you age it. Um, and I can see that that would work with this one. This beer, at this point, and I'm I'm drinking it, I think just not long after it's been released to the bottle shops and things, you can feel it feels just that little bit boozy. Maybe letting this one mellow out would give you even more uh, out of it, but I think it's, it's really good as it is. And I would go as far as saying that this is potentially one of the most authentic non-Belgian, or yeah, maybe non-Belgian, non-Dutch, whatever, non-low country um, quadruples that I've had. But you know, this is Japan, Itokodori, take something in, play with it, learn how it works, and then you know, make it even better. That's how it goes. But yeah, that's a great quadruple. That is very, very good. So thumbs up to both uh, Sakoko Kobo and uh, Shiga Kogan. Uh, Tamamura Honten for this one. This is great. Um, but it gives you everything you'd want. You've got the lovely fruity character, you've got the big brown sugars, you've got the little touch of hoppy character, and you do have that little bit of alcohol warmth, which you would expect at 13% ABV. So yeah, let's do as we always do. We'll break the flavour of this beer down then and just describe what's going on. Ah, 
So yeah, the flavor of this beer, middle third of your palate. The backbone of the beer for me has that lovely kind of rye bready, bread crusty character. Um, as you move further forward on that middle third of your palate, um, it's got a really nice little bit of woodiness to it. So yeah, they've got the rye bready bread crust, the woodiness, and there's a wee bit of like um, sort of Jacob's cream cracker sitting above that. So um, yeah, it's pretty good how that goes together. Above that though, you do start to get a kind of sweeter little bit of rye bread there. So you can feel that rye bready layer just on top of the kind of crackery note that I was talking about. It's quite an oily rye bread as well, I would say. Then above that, you get the wholemeal brown bready layer, which is a little bit more grainy and a little bit sort of um, lighter, I would say. Um, so yeah, the more dense and oily rye bread, the lighter and kind of more grainy and dry wholemeal brown bread and within that wholemeal brown bread there's a little touch of nuttiness coming out of the beer I would say. Um, above that you have a little bit of um, an almost like a dry sponge cakey sort of layer and again it feels like it's sort of brandy soaked or sherry soaked or something like that um, and yeah the nuttiness kind of extends up in there as well I would say. So yeah, is there anything else really to say about the malty part, or the kind of bready part of the beer? Not overly, I think. Um, so yeah, then when you go above the bready layer and the cake, the sort of sponge cake layer, you're into the brown sugary side of things. So you've got a layer of toasty brown sugar there, which is very obvious. So yeah, lovely kind of toasty brown sugar. So yeah, lovely kind of toasty brown sugar in there. Um, in the middle of your palate, that you'll feel there's this kind of oily circle there, and it's interesting because there's not overly much brown sugar there. There's a, it comes out in the beginning, at least it comes out more into the aftertaste. So you've got the toasty brown sugary character there, and within the circle, it's quite wet underneath. But you do feel there's a little, a very slight leathery brown sugar. Then above that, in the dead century part, you've got that more treacle molasses um, sort of thing. Um, and yeah, that is obviously the boozy side of the beer. But you can feel this one, like I say, this maybe letting this mellow out for a wee bit longer in the bottle um, might give you more and more of the brown sugary um, things. Because I have tried some home-brewed barley wines and stuff like this where, yeah, you have this booziness and it takes the beer just that little bit more time to kind of mellow out. But I think it is still really nice in the form that it's in. So yeah, you get that little bit of treacle molasses in the dead centre of your palate. There is a wee bit of a sweeter caramel there and maybe a little elements of kind of fudgy notes. So yeah, that big brown sugary circle in the middle of your palate is most, most definitely there. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah, where do we go from there into the aftertaste? Yeah, more of the breadiness and a little bit of the nuttiness is coming out. But yeah, um, remember with your palate that sweeter flavours come out further forward on the palate, more dry and bitter flavours come out further back. And um, on the back third of your palate, you're going to find very similar flavours to the middle third of your palate, just at different intensities. So let's move further back to that back third of your palate then. So the border region between middle and back third of your palate, you get the nice bready build up in there. It's the kind of rye bread in the base, the wholemeal brown bread in the middle, then the wee bit of the more kind of cakey note on top. But yeah, the base of that back third of your palate, you've got the rye bready bread across in there, which is a little bit drier, of course. You've got the kind of crackery notes that I was talking about. Then you've got the rye bready layer there, which again feels a little bit drier, lighter, more airy. Then the wholemeal brown bread above that, which again is a little bit lighter, drier and more airy. Then you can feel the sort of more oily, sweet, sherry soaked. It's maybe like a caramel sponge is another way to describe it. Yeah, sherry soaked, caramel sponge, fruit roll type thing. That kind of creeps over the top 
of the um, the back third of your palate as well. Then above that you've got some of the toasty brown sugars and a slightly more oily brown sugary character just creeps over there as well. Then it's all about the yeasty side of things on top of everything else. So let's focus on that kind of yeasty character for the moment then. But yeah, that's really good. Um, the yeasty side of things for me, at its core, like it's a really sweet, oily, oily rye bread. And as you go further out from that, it's more like a kind of caramel soaked rye bread. And then, yeah, you've got the bread crusty character on the very edge of that. So yeah, all that yeasty character just sits on top of the back third of your palate. And it's, um, it's really nice how all that goes together. Um, yeah, definitely back third of your palate, you can feel the flavour is taller. Then as you move further forward into the middle third of your tongue, it just kind of condenses down and squashes together that little bit more. So, um, yeah, it's good stuff. On the hoppy side of things then, um, you do get a little touch of bitterness out of this one. And again, that's something that might disappear if you age this beer a little bit more. But yeah, um, back corners of the palate, there's a nice little touch of earthiness there. As you move further forward, it's maybe very slightly kind of woody. Uh, and then, yeah, as you push further and further forward from that, it's got some nice floral aromaticity to it. And round the front curve of the tongue, it's definitely that wee bit lighter and more uh, kind of grassy, I would say. A little touch zesty too, but yeah, you can feel the hoppy character in this beer is just that little bit more oily rather than anything else. But yeah, let's focus on the fruity side of things then and the, uh, the front third of your palate. So yeah, front third of your palate, uh, the border region between front third and middle third of your palate, you get that nice little bit of bready build up in there. You can feel the rye bread in the base, the wholemeal brown bread in the middle, and a wee touch of the kind of more sponge cakey thing on top. The base of that front third of your palate is a little bit more of, um, yeah, I'd say it's a little bit more kind of wholemeal uh, yeah, the bread crust is a little bit more rye bready, as we say. Then you've got the the um, the the cracker, the rye bread, the wholemeal brown bread, and the sort of sponge cake you know above that. Then you get that nice oily bubble where the juicy fruity esters roll the way out of the beer. So let's have a little look at the fruity side of things in this one. And yeah, we definitely say that the the um, the bready side on that front third of your palate is definitely more oily but on the fruity side of things yeah it's a lot less sort of candy than the fruity flavours um, in the flavour in comparison to what you might think it's going to be from the aroma it's a lot more authentic if you like uh, in terms of its fruity quality than the aroma would have you believe but yeah if you go to the back of that uh front third of your palate then in that oily bubble that I was talking about you'll get a nice little bit of um there's definitely a little bit of plum in there if you move further down it's a little bit more kind of pruney and then you've got dates um in the base at the back of that front third of your palate then it's um as you move further forward it's got more sultana kind of flavors maybe a little bit of oily pear and things but then, yeah, in the dead centre of the front third of your palate, the fruity side of things is more kind of figgy. There's a little bit of, like, black currant in there. I don't know if I'd go as far as blackberry. Yeah, kind of more black currant-y. So, yeah, plums, prunes, dates, sultanas, figs, maybe a bit of um, oily pear as well. And then, um, yeah, a little bit of kind of black currant, I would say. And I think... That describes the fruity side of this beer. And it gets a little bit drier into the aftertaste too. You can feel a little bit of the kind of brew sugar in there on that board region between front and middle third of your palate. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, of, of, there's a lot of brew sugar kind of coming out of that area there. So um, yeah, the way that that goes together, I think, is um, it's really nice. The fruity side of this beer is very authentic. And generally speaking, the flavour profile of this beer I would say it's very authentic, but yeah, it would be good to let this one mellow out a little bit and see how it uh, matures. But even in this early stage, it's very good. Um, let's move on to the kind of mouthfeel side of things then, just to round off the review. Like I said earlier, a lot of Japanese craft beers 
you'll find give you the flavour profiles you want and this one is very very good in terms of authenticity when it comes to flavour profile but you will find that they are very light and very clean and you can feel that a little bit with um, with this beer but it works in its favour I would say um, so yeah very clean and very nice quadruple based on that but yeah I would describe this beer as being what would we say Yeah, kind of bottom end of full bodied for me. Carbonation does have that degree of crispness. As I say, this is because they add the brew sugar into the beer and let it um, settle within the bottle. So yeah, you've got a nice little bit of carbonation to this one. Uh, the IBU count of this is probably about 15 or 20 at the absolute most. You do get a little bit of bitterness and dryness into the aftertaste, the earthy side of things on the floral side of it. But then yeah, the malt base, as we see, it's a bit of graininess underneath smoothness in the middle and then a kind of drier and oily sweetness on top and then yeah you've got a lovely sort of um oily fruity character coming out of this one as well mainly soft and kind of red fruity actually so yeah um a little bit dry again the fruity side of this beer is a little bit drier into the aftertaste too so all in all a very authentic quadruple in terms of its flavor profile for me potentially one of the most authentic ones that i've had from a non-Belgian Dutch uh, brewery actually. So really kudos to Zakoku Kobo and uh, Shiga Kogan for pulling this one off. This is a very, very good beer. I just wish I'd got a, another bottle of it to age a little bit. So yeah, I need to see if I can get another one before I, I leave Japan in fact. But yeah, um, really nicely done. Very happy with this one, like I said, lovely oily fruit. Uh, the malt base, as we see, has those kind of dry layers. The IBU in this one, what is that going to be? Um, I'd say the IBU in this one's probably about, yeah, 15, 20 IBUs, which is quite standard for it. But yeah, um, your malty side of things, a bit dry underneath, smoother in the middle, and then kind of oily, I would say. And then you get all the nice kind of brown sugary characters to it. But a beautiful, beautiful quadruple, this one. And I'm really glad that I got the chance to, uh, to try this. So thumbs up. Shiga Kogan and uh, Zokoko Kobo for this one. But I think we can leave it that. I'm getting a little bit tired actually. So yeah, I think we can round off this review uh, at that point. So yeah, this beer was simply called Quadruple, a 30% quadruple using um, Shiga Kogan Spelt and um, Zokobu or Zokoku Kobo's uh, own rye to celebrate both breweries 20th anniversary so yeah check out both breweries if you haven't done so already i hope i can do some more it's a coco uh kobu kobo <laughs> keep pronouncing that wrong it's a koku kobu kobo uh beers over the next little while but yeah thank you again for watching uh let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below let me know what your favorite beers are from shiga kogan and from zako uh, kobo Hopefully we can return to both these brews at some point in the near future. But in the meantime, check out my social media, check out the brewery social media, with them, wish them a happy 20th anniversary, and I will catch you guys in another review very, very soon. Until the next time, Slanja, Skull, Cheers, Kampai, and catch you guys later. Ciao.